welcome to Nature Revisited. Today, we are going to visit VINS, the Vermont Institute of Natural Science, located in Queechy, Vermont. VINS is known for its recovery and rehabilitation efforts with birds, and in particular, birds of prey. This summer, I heard about their new exhibit, the Forest Canopy Walk, which opens this fall at their main campus. With all of the excitement surrounding the anticipation of its opening, I was curious to learn more about Vins and all that it has to offer. So recently, I was able to meet with Charles Radigan, the director of Vins, Mary Davison Graham, the assistant director, Chris Collins, the director of on-site programs and exhibits, and Margaret Lohman, also known as Canopy Meg. And they shared with me the history, the mission, and the culture of Vins, as well as all of the educational programs that they are involved with. But before we get to the interviews, I would like to share the following story. After the interviews, I went to the bird displays, hoping that one of the bald eagles might have something to say. Of course, they were silent. That's when I ran into Harry Hudson, a volunteer at Vins, and I asked him if he might be able to help. After getting the eagle to speak, he shared this with me. So I was, sometimes you meditate with her and visualize uh, that we're flying, soaring over a river in a canyon, and she'll go from screaming at you to completely placid in the snap of your finger. That's her bark. I have a story for you. That, uh, she was, they had given her a wooden egg in the, in the spring and she was sitting it every day and tending her nest, but because it wasn't hatching, it was making her very unhappy. And it became necessary that two of us go in to take care of her at a time. And she jumped off of her perch, and then the male jumped off of his perch, and they both ran along the side, and she became, she turned all of her attention to the male and chased him down and caught him by the talons, and they laid on the ground with their talons locked together. And they were both screaming screaming at one another and so with a little shot from the hose they split up and she continued to walk and the male returned to his perch and she continued to walk and walked across in front of us while we were watching her and she did this most wonderful thing she uh, did the dance that you see at the powwow when they enter at the powwow and they're dressed in all the regalia with the porcupine quills and the feathers and the beads and she did this step, hop, step, hop, step, hop. And it was so beautiful. It was like her saying, this is my place. Witness my strength. Witness my courage. Witness this beauty. It, uh, it was truly moving. And it made me think how many people who have done that dance have never had the opportunity to see the eagle actually do that. Vins is the kind of place where this can happen. So Vins uh, was founded in 1972, and there were four founders, uh, David Laughlin, his wife, Sarah Laughlin, uh, June McKnight, a biologist named uh, Rick uh, Farrar. It came into existence because the Ottaquiche River in the 60s and 70s was, was really quite polluted. It was used really as a dumping ground for uh, household as well as commercial waste. So the river was really in bad shape. And this group of people, and there were others involved as well, actively worked to force the cleanup of the Ottaquiche River. And by that cleanup was to stop the indiscriminate dumping of, uh, of waste and chemicals in it and they had success. There's some talk that this might have also been an inspiration for more federal uh, regulation of, uh, of rivers. 
so as their success happened, they said, well, wouldn't this be a good idea to keep this effort going, but let's change it a bit and let's make it, if we can, uh, something that's involving environmental education. Well, over time, it began to evolve. The concept started, I think, with the birds and bird banding and research related to birds. And then it eventually moved into uh, education, a primarily wonderful concept, parent volunteers in schools teaching environmental concepts, primarily an elementary school level. And it was something called the ELF program or uh, environmental learning for the future. And this became a template for all of the educational efforts that Vince has undertaken. Early 80s, uh, they did the Raptor Center. This is all when they were in Woodstock, uh, Vermont. So during the course of the 80s and 90s, uh, the Raptor Center's efforts where people could come in and see uh, these birds of prey up close, or someone with an injured bird could bring it in and have it treated with the potential that it could be re-released re to the wild. So it evolved, it, it grew. Uh, they had a number of different uh, nature centers. Uh, but all the time, the focus on the mission of environmental education was, was, was paramount, and that continues today. Maybe elaborate a little bit more. What is the mission of VINS? and then maybe talk about some of the programs that you have, because there are quite a few programs here. Uh, so Vin's uh, mission today is uh, motivating individuals and communities to care for the environment through education, research, and wildlife rehabilitation. Out of those three, I think uh, education really is front and center. We have a, an active school program activity where our educators, who are all master's degrees, uh, work with teachers to help shape science education in elementary and middle school, and actually pre-K as well, uh, very active in uh, the area of young children. We are in, uh, I think uh, last year we were in 29 schools, and there's both a professional development component as well as an education component. Uh, the other uh, important educational component is what we do here on campus. The Vins Nature Center is 47 acres, very attractive mix of, uh, of habitats uh, from, uh, from woods to uh, riparian zones along the river to a beautiful meadow. So people are welcomed here, one, to hang out, if you will, interact with what goes on here. But also we have uh, three programs every day that uh, concentrate on certain aspects of the natural history of wild birds. As an added uh, benefit, we have, I think, 30 or so raptors in enclosures, and people are able to see these birds. These birds have been injured, can't be released to the wild, so they act as ambassadors for their species. And then we have a, a cadre of education birds. Those are birds that are trained to sit on the arm of, a, of an educator on a glove. We call it bird on glove. And they participate in the daily programs. So not only do you learn about the natural history of, for instance, a barn owl, but you have an opportunity to see that barn owl fly from a, an educator to an educator. We also have a number of world-class exhibits. So we have uh, the story of the evolution of birds from theropod dinosaurs called Birds or Dinosaurs. We've built an adventure playscape for kids or ad adventuresome adults, but it's a place to, uh, to climb, uh, to crawl, to perch. So a very uh, fun place. We have a, a great summer camp program. This past season, we had over 530 children participate. And that's all the way from peeps, which are the young kids, four, to uh, uh, middle school. And it's a day camp, but we also have a, uh, an overnight camp, uh, science and research oriented. So uh, we have, uh, I think, approximately 23 full-time people. 
In the summer months, that jumps may get up to close to 40. VINS is a, a nonprofit organization, completely independent from any state or federal organization, supported by uh, revenue we generate from uh, visitors, from programs that we give throughout the state, grants, and gifts. So my friends know me as the bird guy. Uh, essentially, I've been engaged uh, with the outdoors uh, really since I was a child. I find every outdoor experience to be interesting. My father loved the Adirondack Mountains, so we uh, spent our summer vacations in the Adirondacks. So early on, both my brother and I became uh, uh, interested in, in birds and, and bird watchers at a, at a very young age. I ended up working in public television at Penn State University after I graduated from college and spent a bit of time in the military began doing educational programs, primarily, as it turned out, in the, in the nature area. And it became really a lifelong passion for me. And when I became an independent producer, um, I concentrated in that area. I did some work with uh, PBS, had a television series called Birdwatch for three years, and then did some work uh, for National Geographic, and particularly a show called National Geographic Today. 2014, this job became available. I am by nature a risk taker, and uh, I have an entrepreneurial bet, and it seemed like a, a nice place to be. And it's turned out to be wonderful. When it comes to, to raptors and birds, like an eagle, it seems to me that no matter what your background or what you've been taught, that when you look at a, an eagle, there's something about it that's majestic. So I'm curious, is, do you think that nature, the evolution of nature, actually had a play in why an eagle or a bird looks the way it does? Uh, so that's a, an interesting question. So this is not original with me. I wish it was. Uh, but uh, evolution is not necessarily survival of the fittest. It's survival of the beautiful. And I think that the beauty, or to use your word, the majestic nature of a bird of prey is, is so extraordinary. And uh, so that heart-stopping, eye-catching, uh, that whatever your background is, you look at it and, and you have to stop and you have to say, Wow, no, that is really something special. Now, I think that's true with most living things, not simply eagles. We think, and part of our philosophy here is, uh, that if someone is exposed uh, to these creatures, has a sense of what they are, their natural history, they're going to be more inclined to work for preservation and protection. And most of our activities, while science-based, really are to create awareness in people that there's value, intrinsic value, in, in these creatures. And it creates a mosaic, if you will, of, of the world that's important to maintain. So, Mary. Can we talk a bit about how the birds get here and the ceremonies surrounding their release back into the wild? It's car strikes, it's cats and dogs mostly. And we also have transporters that are volunteers from all over the state of Vermont and they actually go through a training program once a year how to handle birds and how to transport them in a quiet, you know, very dark, you know, um, safe haven for them to travel in. So we offer that training uh, once a year, and we have about 25 transporters in this area that help us out throughout the state of Vermont and New Hampshire. The gay mordens are a big component of that as well, but not as large, but they do bring in specific species, mostly raptors, because they get tangled up in circumstances that it's very difficult to get to them, and they have the capability to do that. 
So what happened was there were a couple of men uh, snowmobiling. They noticed that the bald eagle was face planted in the snow, barely alive, a good sized bird, a mature bird. It turned out that they brought it in <laughs> during our busiest day of the year. Um, it turned out that it was not firm as to what happened to the animal, but we think that it had some sort of toxic poisoning, meaning it may have eaten an old carcass. And so uh, it was in our care for over 60 days and pulled out. I mean, it was really not in good shape. And we were so happy to see it fly away in Windsor. And then another bald eagle came in the middle of the sky and met the animal as it had taken off. It was so majestic. So it was really a great day. We invite the media to um, share with people how important our work is. And also we invite um, specific people who have found the birds and had cared, you know, amazingly so um, on the good health of its success. And if it can get released, they want to be part of that release um, because it's very moving uh, to see that happen. Uh, most of the time we do invite the folks that do bring the birds in to our care uh, because they do want to be a part of the release um, if it's successful, and most of the time it is. We've been historically successful with intakes with loons. Um, loons cannot fly without being in water, so they have been found in parking lots, um, thinking that the parking lot is water, but it's actually a sheet of ice and they've just in the wrong place at the wrong time and are not able to have takeoff to fly. And we've been able to rescue several loons in the past and then get them back into good shape, good nutrition, and then release them so that they can migrate because they migrate over to the seashore. We don't usually get a lot of waterfowl in. Hi, Chris. Let's start by talking about some of your experiences here at Vince. I don't have an exact example of one moment when I think uh, someone was connected to nature more strongly through a program, but more a general experience of many, many people over the years. To me, a lot of the impact is long lasting, even though the experience they may have had was only, you know, an hour or two or three here at the Nature Center. But that, that piece, that time that they had with us has long lasting implications and goes, is one piece of the uh, building of a good conservation ethic. And so the, the experiences that people get here, seeing a bird either fly over them, getting up close to one, that, that sharing, I think, of the enthusiasm uh, for nature is one of the biggest things that we can partake in as an educator. By having this nature center, people can come here, have a unique experience that otherwise they wouldn't be able to. Uh, one of our educators was down in Rhode Island yesterday and Saturday um, doing a program for their raptor festival. And, you know, in one program, I think they did something like 16 flyovers with our Harris's hawk, uh, which means he flies right over your head and by right over just a few inches above. That experience, that awe, is something that we are able to give to people. And I think that's really special. Have you ever had like a particular bird that touched you in a way that... Oh yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, I've been fortunate enough to work with a lot of birds. When we moved to Quichi, I was brought on in 04 as one of the educators. And I um, was lucky enough to work with a bald eagle and a golden eagle. And although everyone loves bald eagles, and I love them too, the golden eagle was extremely special for me as a younger educator. And to be able to have this bird sit on my glove she was huge, she was impressive, magnificent, uh, and when she was upset, she would let me know by squeezing down on my arm until I said, uncle. And, uh, and the power, you know, that is within that bird, within Golden Eagles, period, is um, something I've never forgotten. 
the other bird that mentioned was the Harris's hawk, and and he is one that has such a unique character, and his physical abilities are just stunning. Uh, you know, several years ago we said, what if we just, you know, what if we toss something in the air for him to catch? And you know, how about a mouse? Let's you know, go for that. And so we do mouse tosses with him, and he'll just literally go upside down, go straight vertical up, flip upside down, grab the mouse, and then fly somewhere to eat it. And his physical abilities are just stunning. Uh, and to be able to share that with an audience, that they get a big smile on their face. And every time I fly a bird, I get a big smile on my face too, so. What's it like to look directly into the eyes of an eagle? Uh, you have to hope that... I mean, they look back. Right? They do look back. That bird was extremely intelligent. Um, but yeah, just looking into the eyes of, of really any of these birds is, uh, they look right back at you. And, you know, unfortunately they can't speak our language, so we can't really know exactly what they're thinking, but uh, it's fun to wonder. The canopy walk is the primary focus at the moment. So it's the Vins Forest Canopy Walk. My first experience so is in, uh, on a canopy walk was in Costa Rica in Monteverde National Forest. It's a rainforest, but thought it was an extraordinary experience. I have a friend who's a scientist, a woman named Margaret Lauman, Meg Lauman, uh, known as Canopy Meg, actually began uh, with others, uh, the idea that you could study the canopy by being in it for extended periods of time, that you were not observing from the ground or you were not simply climbing a tree and spending uh, a little bit, like, bit of time, but actually platforms and, and, and sleeping, etc. And when I came to Vins and we looked at the future and the potential for growth here, we knew that we were going to need something unique and special. So I suggested to the board and to the staff that we consider creating a canopy type experience. So um, this is a somewhat unique in, in both its uh, design and, and execution. It's an elevated walk in the trees. At its highest point, you're actually 100 feet above the forest floor in what we call the tree house which takes you actually up through the canopy and then above it. But the main part of the walk, which is 900 or so feet, is uh, on one level, and you don't have to climb to get on it. Now people say, well, how can you do that? The ground slopes down from a, a ledge. You're able to start at ground level and continue out, which makes this walk accessible to people with limited mobility, mothers with strollers. I had my granddaughter out on it uh, not that long ago. So you're able to get up probably 50 or 60 feet above the forest floor, so you're really among the leaves. You're not looking up, you're eye to eye with them. And any creature that happens to be within, that, uh, within your view shed as well. And then we've built uh, some intriguing features because we think that it's an opportunity for people to learn about the forest. So there are interpretive platforms. And then there are a number of special places. One is the giant spider web. Uh, we've actually woven the, the netting and uh, we'll stretch it across an opening. It's redundant, so there's safety inspired by something we saw over at uh, Wild Walk in Tupper Lake, New York at the Wild Center. You'll crawl out on this and uh, if you're not a faint of heart, you'll be able to look down and see the forest floor 50 feet below you. And then uh, a couple other uh, places I've described, the tree house, which is a, an elevated uh, climbing stairs to the top. And then the eagle's nest is another place There'll be uh, a couple of eagle sculptures up there as well, and then natural history of, uh, of eagles, um, and then a number of observation platforms. I heard that you just came off the canopy walk for the first time. 
I do. Can you give me your impressions? Oh my goodness, I am absolutely blown away. It's fantastic. It's one of the best I have ever experienced. It really brings nature right to your face, and it's a fabulous, fabulous addition, not just to Vermont, but for the whole world. It's truly an architectural wonder. Everybody's in for a treat. That was Canopy Meg after her first visit to the completed Vins Forest Canopy Walk. You can hear the rest of our conversation on the next edition of Nature Revisited. If you would like to learn more about the programs that Vins has to offer and the Forest Canopy Walk, please visit them at vinsweb.org. Whether you live in the Upper Valley or just planning a trip here, I highly recommend a visit to the Vermont Institute of Natural Science. As always, you can follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. Nature Revisited is produced by Stefan Van Orden and Charles Gagan. Please join us for the next edition of Nature Revisited with Canopy Meg. Until then, do remember, we are nature. Thank <laughs> you.